My friends, welcome back to the Community Presbyterian Church in downtown Pismo Beach, California. Uh, I come to you today on Sunday, May 16th, 2021. Today we begin our service by lighting the peace candle. You'll see it burning over my shoulder. And uh, given the that my theme for this Sunday, the scripture, the sermon, is on the theme of prayer. Uh, I found a neat quote by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, formerly the Archbishop of South Africa, and a quote that he, that he wrote called, Why Pray? Which I thought was really poignant, especially in light of the heartbreaking violence uh, in the Mideast, as well as the heartbreaking violence in our own lives. And so let me share with you just briefly about uh, Desmond Tutu. I had a chance to hear him speak uh, back in 1987 at Riverside Church in New York, and it was so inspiring. Uh, he's always been a man of peace, joy, and love, even though he lived in a country, South Africa, full of the racist violence of apartheid. He never let it make him bitter, but he believed that he would overcome hate with good. Archbishop Tutu, uh, his extraordinary contributions promoting justice and tolerance earned him a Nobel Prize in 1984. He was elected the first black Anglican Bishop of Johannesburg, South Africa, and later was elected Archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa the highest position in the Anglican Church in that nation. Throughout his life, he has been known as a spiritual leader who cares about the needs of people around the world, teaching love and compassion to all. Here is his quote called, Why Pray? That was given at the very end of a speech he gave decades ago, but it's so it's so timely to our world today. He writes, so why do we pray in a world gone mad? Because our prayers for others may vicariously raise them to new life, bring them into the family of God, bring them to contrition and repentance, because our faithful prayers can change the world. How do we pray in a world gone mad? With persistence, confidence, and joy, with humility and repentance, knowing that the God who created us and our world has a soft spot for sinners, so much that heaven rejoices over the one who is found more than the 99 who were never lost. May we pray for a world gone mad, one lost soul at a time. Might heaven rejoice in the effects of our prayers. Amen. Thanks be to God for Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And may his words inspire us to be persistent in prayer. Amen. Now, my friends, hear the scripture lesson I've selected for today uh, with our theme being prayer. And actually, the lesson is from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. And we hear Jesus praying to God right at the last moments of his life before he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so God thinking about his disciples, prays these words. And this is selection, selections from chapter 17. Jesus prays, Dear God, I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou hast gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they know that everything that thou hast given me is from thee. For I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from thee. 
and they have believed that thou didst send me. I am praying for them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. I do not pray for these only, referring to his uh, closest disciples or apostles, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus concludes, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these know that thou hast sent me. I made known to them thy name, and I will make it known that the love which, which thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. When I was a junior at UCLA back in 1981, the Presbyterian campus pastor, Dr. Charles Doak, made a comment which always stuck with me. Chuck, as we called him then, said, Robert, you can really learn a lot about a person's theology by listening to them pray. I asked Chuck what he learned about my theology from hearing me pray on those occasions at our college group when I was asked to lead the prayer. And Chuck said, I learned that your parents instilled in you that gratitude is the proper spirit with which to approach God in prayer. Friends, until that moment, I had never really noticed that my prayers usually began and ended by thanking God. And there's no doubt, my parents did indeed instill that practice in me. As I've said before, my dad, just days before he died, asked his pastor to offer a prayer of gratitude for the life he had been blessed to live as a husband, a father, a neighbor, a pastor. Dad lived his life in a spirit of gratitude, and yes, my dad died in a spirit of gratitude. That doesn't mean that my dad had a perfect carefree life with no sorrows or disappointments, or far from it. He once had a painful professional setback and his sorrows included the death of his beloved younger brother, Alan, <clears throat> my uncle who died in a car accident one New Year's Eve when Alan was only in his early 40s. My dad felt it was vital for the life of faith for us to hold on to gratitude, come what may. And one way to do that, the Bible says, is to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean praying hour after hour nonstop. It means realizing that you live daily in the presence of a loving God. No matter what happens, joy or sorrow, you're living in the presence of a good God. Such knowledge is a gift of grace. This past Thursday night, I prayed a prayer of gratitude for life, for family, for friends, for God's steadfast love as I held the hand of Sandy Madison and her son, Jim, in the ER at Marion Hospital. Despite the very real and hard struggles of Sandy's health, we, the three of us, were filled with gratitude for the gift of that time together. 
for the gift of love and friendship. One of my dad's spiritual mentors, Father Henry Nowen, said that prayer is living. In an excerpt from one of his best-selling books, Father Nowen discusses the centrality of prayer in Christian life. In a discussion on prayer, Father Nowen wrote, Prayer leads you to see new paths and to hear new melodies in the air. I love that. Prayer leads you to hear new melodies in the air. Prayer is the breath of your life, which gives you freedom to go find the many signs which point out the way to a new land. Said Nowen, praying is not simply some necessary compartment in the daily schedule of a Christian or a source of, or only a source of uh, comfort and support in a time of need, nor is prayer restricted to Sunday mornings or mealtimes. Praying is living. Said Nowen, praying is living. Prayer is expressed in eating and drinking, action and rest, teaching and learning, playing and working. Said Nowen, prayer, praying, pervades every aspect of our lives. It is the unceasing recognition that God is wherever we are, always inviting us to come closer and to celebrate the divine gift of being alive. Father Nowen concludes, in the end, a life of prayer is a life with open hands, a life where we need not be ashamed of our weaknesses, but realize that it is more perfect for us to be led by God than to try and hold everything in our own hands. Friends, in our scripture lesson this morning, we heard Jesus pray. And if we listen carefully, we discover in this passage in the Gospel of John and throughout the New Testament that for Jesus, praying is living. The prayer of Jesus in the 17th chapter of John reveals his theology, his faith in God, his trust in God, his love for God, his belief that God's spirit of love pervades every aspect of his life, play as well as work. And Christ's compassionate prayer reveals his deep love for his disciples, indeed, for all humanity striving to find their way in the world. Just hours before Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays to God that his disciples, after he is no longer among them, will experience a profound unity and an uncommon love in their relationship with God and their ongoing relationship with each other. From Jesus' prayer, we learn that he desires for his followers to experience the very same unity and love with God that Jesus and God had experienced between themselves. In Jesus, we see what we could call a theology of solidarity. The idea that when we move close to God, we discover he's been moving to us all the time in a great act of solidarity, of a love that never ends. In chapter 17, verse 11, Jesus prays, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And in verse 25 and 26, Jesus concludes his prayer saying, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these followers know that thou have sent me. I made known to them thy name, and I will make it known that the love with which thou hast loved me 
may be in them and I in them. Friends, despite knowing the harsh realities which awaited him soon, including betrayal, arrest, beatings, crucifixion, Jesus does not pray here in a spirit of fear, anger, or lament. He prays in a spirit of caring and gratitude. It is clear that Jesus is deeply thankful for the men and women who have stood by his side in the journey of faith. Jesus loves them. He takes the time to pray because for Jesus, prayer is living. Talking to God is as natural for Jesus as breathing. And so, in the final moments of his freedom, before his arrest, Jesus prays for the disciples to experience the unique joy in life, which comes to one who is embraced by a unity and a love rooted in the divine, rooted in an eternal relationship with Almighty God. Jesus felt an incredible unity with God. He felt loved and he wanted, he wanted so badly when he was gone for his disciples to discover and experience that unity and love as well. My friends, that life-giving unity, that empowering and healing love is what God desires for us as well in 2021. Indeed, God desires to be in a relationship with us, with you and me, as real and true as God's relationship was with Christ. Why? Because like a devoted parent, God loves us and wants the best for us. From all four Gospels, it is clear to me that prayer is to be the center of our life in Christ. And it is a gift of grace we each can enjoy. A prayer is not the domain merely of popes and bishops or pastors, priests, imams, and rabbis. Prayer is a gift for all women and men, for prayer is living. This is a truth captured in a poetic statement entitled, Teach Me to Pray, given to me by a woman at this church many years ago. I close with these simple yet poignant words by an unknown author. As we strive today to, ex to experience God's presence in prayer, God's presence in our daily life, says, a seeker to God. Please teach me, Lord. I want to know exactly how to pray. I need some words. Which ones are right? Please tell me what to say. I've bowed my head. I've knelt down. But should I be upright? I've closed my eyes. I've raised my hands. Or should I fold them tight? Lord, when I pray, do I stand up or should I sit down? Dear Lord, what do you like? Are lights turned on or are they off? Maybe candlelight? Lord, should, when I pray, should I whisper or speak out loud? Do I quote the Bible when I pray? What do you think about the right time to pray? Do you prefer the dawn? Should I pray fast or keep it slow? Better short or long? I'm new at this. What are the rules? I want to do it right. How do I know you'll even hear or that I am in your sight? Friends, then the sincere person in his quest to know how to pray said this. And while I sat there quietly waiting for some sign, I heard a gentle voice say, Oh, dearest child of mine, do you think I really care about the time of day or whether you're standing up or kneeling when you pray? I don't care about your posture or about the place you choose. Just open up your soul to me. 
I have no other rules, said God to the seeker. Tell me what is in your heart and tell me what you seek. Tell me of your sorrows and of those things that made you weak. Speak to me in private about what concerns you most. I know about your good deeds. You have no need to boast. Said God, my child, you don't need prayer lessons. Just talk to me each day. Tell me anything you want, dear child. Anyone can pray. Amen. Now let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for our church, for the friendships and relationships formed here. We thank you, O oh God, that you bring us together to make a new community that is outward looking, that looks out into the community and seeks to respond with compassionate, caring, with support. Dear God, we look across the ocean and we are filled with heartbreak when we see the violence, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in the Mideast as Jews and Palestinians continue violence toward each other. Uh, enmity that goes back centuries, we know. We pray, O oh God, that this, this murder and killing of men, women, and children would end, that greater minds would stand up in both of those communities and find a way for this cycle of violence to, to end. We know that's your will. And we also know, O oh God, that Jews and Palestinians alike are children of God. We are all brothers and sisters on this planet. Help us, O oh God, to, to find peace where there is no peace. We pray this day, O oh God, for the family of Detective Luca Benedetti, of the San Luis Obispo Police Department, whose life was taken from him this past week, shot down as he was serving this community as a police officer, daily putting on his uniform and badge 
with the desire to be a servant. We pray for his family, and his wife, and his young children, for all his friends and colleagues in this time of heartbreak for them. And we pray, O oh God, for the family and friends of the man who committed that violent act of taking the life of Luca Benedetti, Mr. Edward Guyron. We pray, O oh God, that his family, who mourns as well, mourns the Edward that was a good person, that became a lost person, whose mental illness not only cost him his life, but took a dad and a husband away from another family in one huge act of violent heartbreak. Pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would bring healing and comfort to those families, and especially to Officer Benedetti's children. Kids need their dad. And so we know the journey will be a difficult one for those children. And we pray that uh, that they will discover in their lives uh, men and women who care for them, uh, who are able to, to be for them what their father can no longer be, source of support and encouragement and comfort. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of prayer. We thank you that created this incredible world and the people in it, and you didn't leave, that you sent us Jesus to remind us of how deep your love is for all your children on earth. Help us each, O oh God, to be, uh, to pray, and not to worry about where we pray or how we pray, but just to open our heart to you. For you are a God of steadfast love. You are a God who is there for us in joy and in sorrow. Dear God, hear us now as we pray together, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Honor every person. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.